really great to hear. Um, because I, you know, I'm starting to recruit, you know, masters and PhD students and specifically really want to recruit native students. And so I have a couple masters native students, I think are coming in next year, which I'm really excited about to work with me. Um, but knowing, you know, that you guys have this program, I'd love to be able to send them there. Um, and and oh, get that awesome. sort of perspective. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's definitely something I would, I would love to chat <coughs> once I get yeah. students in. Yeah, definitely. You know, with our um, internship program, you know, Rebecca is doing the um, dendrochronology one, and mm. I have one in our department, Rebecca's and I department in education, um, archaeology, the lab, um, the bone one. What is Jonathan's? Uh, zoo arc. The zoo arc. <laughs> the <bone thing>. <laughs> <laughs> He's the bone guy. And... No. <laughs> So, yeah, so, you know, there's a lot of, uh, there's a lot of different uh, opportunities and, you know, and if you, um, you know, have any Native students or, uh, you know, schools, mm. we definitely would love to, to teach them as well. Mm. And uh, we have a mobile learning lab, which John mm -hmm. is um, getting ready to, to take on the road down in New Mexico. Mm. And so, so that that'll uh, be happening and, you know, we're really wanting to go into some of the schools and other stuff. So that's awesome. That's amazing. That is, I'm so happy to hear all of this is, is part of your guys's programming. It makes me really happy. That's so great. Yeah, no, let's stay connected and, and Definitely. see how we can help each other out. That, mm -hmm. that would be great. That would be awesome. Yeah. And I know that there's a lot of uh, native students that we're trying to recruit here at WSU. And we have some Southwest folks um, like Andrew Duff and Sam Flad. So um, let's definitely oh. keep in communication. And yeah, I think, I think there's definitely some, some room to collaborate and maybe send some students down to learn from y'all. Yeah. When you see Andrew, tell him I said, hi, I will. You used to work <laughs> at Crow Canyon. That's right. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Yep. So I will, I will tell him hello. <laughs> Definitely. So do you have any other questions we can help you out with? You know, not that I can know. think of off the top of my head. I'm sure some things will come up though. Um, and, and I will, I'll find your email and then hopefully, yeah, like I said, we should definitely still stay connected. Cause I think there's definitely, um, I'd love to send students. I really would. I think it's really important. So, yeah. I mean, you could bring, you could bring a uh, group of students with you. Yeah. Yeah. That'd be, that'd be fantastic. Like I said, I've never worked down Southwest, but I, you know, I'm on a few committees now for some Southwest folks, uh, master's students. And so I gotta, I gotta brush up on the Southwest archaeology. <laughs> yeah, that would be great. Yeah, that'd be awesome. <laughs> well, I'm glad we got to connect. <laughs> yeah, totally. Yeah, that's kind of why I like to go on and just say hi and, you know, mm -hmm. um, and, you know, having the webinar and, you know, having it Native American month, you know, is just really important. So it really is. Yeah. No, thank you for taking the time to, to say hi. I really appreciate it. Yeah. And I'll, I'll listen on and then, you know, mm -hmm. in the end, if there, there are any other questions that I have, I'll, I'll jump in. Absolutely. Yes, please do. <laughs> I love a question. <laughs> I know, right? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, say hi to all the peeps out there, all my friends. So sorry. <laughs> <laughs> well, it looks like we're right about at 4 p.m. if you want to get us kicked off, Jonas. Yeah, sounds good. Um, welcome, everybody out there in webinar world. Uh, we are very lucky and grateful to have Emily Van Alst here with us today. Um, she's going to give us a talk on inscribed indigenous wisdom, interpreting rock art through indigenous women's perspectives and voices. Just like to start off with our land acknowledgement. Oops, sorry about that. Just trying to move my little screen. A Crow Canyon Archaeological Center acknowledges the Pueblo, Ute, Paiute, Diné, and Hickory Apache people whose traditional homelands our institution sits. Our mission-related work would not be possible without Indigenous people in the past, present, and future. We respectfully recognize and honor ancestral descendant Indigenous communities for their contributions to all of humankind. Crow Canyon is grateful to all Indigenous people and supports the preservation and protection of cultural traditions, ancestral connections, and sacred lands. 
Uh, just a quick quip about the um, Q&A. So if you do have any questions throughout the presentation, just pop them into the Q&A so that we can keep the uh, chat free for folks to chat with their friends. Um, if you're having any issues, uh, we do have a live stream on Facebook and we are now um, accumulating a great library of past um, webinars as well. So if you wanna head over to our YouTube channel, um, there's a lot of wonderful content on there um, for past um, webinars. Uh, next week, we're gonna have Todd Suravel from uh, University of Wyoming giving us a talk on good fences, make good neighbors and other proverbs from the Pleistocene. So please join us for that webinar as well. I think Taylor's gonna hop on real quick and give you a blurb about our um, cultural explorations coming up. Yeah, thanks so much, Jonas. Uh, in honor of Native American Heritage Month, I just wanted to take a moment to tell you about one of our upcoming cultural explorations travel programs in 2024. Uh, <coughs> the Pueblo World is our first travel seminar to feature only indigenous scholars. And it will give you the opportunity to travel and learn alongside Anthony Lovato and Lee Makino, both of which are wonderful indigenous artists and educators. This trip gives you the opportunity to discover thousands of years of culture present in today's Pueblos through ceremony, art, archaeology, language, and more. We will visit ancestral sites such as Petroglyph and Bandelier National Monuments, and you will have the unique opportunity to attend a corn dance at Kiwa Pueblo. We graciously invite you to join us from March 31st through April 6, 2024 on this one-of-a-kind travel program. To learn more about this and our other events next year, you can find us them on our website at www.crowcanyon.org. Thanks so much. Thank you, Taylor. Um, thank you for continued support and generosity. We really couldn't do the work that we do um, without the support of our donors and board members and folks like you out there in the webinar world. Um, if you're looking for another way to support our mission, um, please consider donating a book to our American uh, Indian Initiatives Library. Um, uh, Rebecca, uh, one of our American Indian Initiatives employees, uh, made a QR code here. So I'll just leave this up for a quick second. So if you want to scan that into your phone. Um, and then I think Taylor was also going to add a link to the chat um, to be able to donate to that library. It's coming along, but uh, there's always more authors and more books. So thank you for your support. Yeah, I, I just want to say thank you all for your support on the books. It, it is getting a little bit bigger. And I so, Rebecca and I so appreciate all of your support on these books. It's it's amazing to have a dream come true, to have an all native library. So thank you all. Thank you, Rebecca. Okay, I'm just gonna give a quick bio intro for Emily Van Alst. Um, she is an indigenous archeologist and it's assistant professor um, of the Department of Anthropology at Washington State University, which is her new, new post, her new first semester. Um, so congratulations on that, Emily. Um, her research is focused on indigenous women's relationships to rock art in the Northwest Plains. She is broadly interested in reclaiming cultural heritage with, by, and for indigenous and descendant communities. She has done community-based archaeology field work in Spain, Peru, and Japan, as well as the United States, including Alaska, South Dakota, Montana, and Wyoming, um, as well as Indiana. So without further ado, I will go ahead and hand it over to Emily. And again, we appreciate you being here and look forward to your talk. Awesome. Thank you so much, Jonas. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. All righty. Um, so today um, I'm going to be talking to you all about how to essentially better incorporate Indigenous women's voices and scholarship and perspectives um, into specifically rock art research. But I think um, this would be incredibly um, applicable to other um, sort of where we're interpreting different cultural, archaeological, cultural material. Um, and so I, again, I hope this is applicable to other folks um, and other projects um, within our discipline as well. 
So I'm going to orient us, uh, since I know we have a lot of Southwest folks uh, in the audience today, I'm going to sort of orient us uh, to the Plains. So the Plains goes from Alberta all the way to Texas, right? It's the middle part of North America. Um, I'm specifically looking at an area uh, between South Dakota, Wyoming, and Montana. So this is sort of the Northwest Plains um, of the United States. And you might be asking, huh, why this specific area? Well, if you look at this regional map um, on your uh, left hand side of your screen, um, this is what is known as the Black Hills. Um, this is the site of emergence for Lakota people. Um, I myself am an indigenous archaeologist, um, a member of the Mackinac Bands of Chippewa and Ottawa Indians, um, as well as uh, Lakota descent. And so um, I primarily work with my Lakota community um, who are currently um, in Pine Ridge Indian uh, Reservation. Um, and so I thought that the best way um, to sort of orient my research um, is really looking at the Black Hills as this is the site um, of Lakota emergence. Uh, I also, um, there's a sort of abundance of rock art um, in and around the Black Hills. And what you see on the right hand side of your screen um, in those little orange elk um, uh, little icons are all the different rock art sites um, that I looked at for my dissertation. Um, so today's uh, talk is primarily my dissertation research, but I'm, as a new assistant professor, um, continuing this research. Um, and so I'll probably have a few more uh, rock art sites um, as I continue to do this work. So before I sort of dive in a little bit more about my research, um, I first want to sort of problematize and think through rock art as a term. Uh, rock art as a term has been used by archaeologists, rock art researchers, and art historians um, to describe painted or scratched images on a rock surface, right, at its most sort of basic definition. Um, for indigenous communities, though, and this is sort of global, um, rock art can just be more than art, right? It might be art, it might communicate that, um, but it could also be something more. Um, for some indigenous communities, that might be um, particular knowledge that's being passed um, from one world to another um, by maybe ancestors or some other sort of spiritual being. Um, maybe the rock art actually depicts ancestors themselves. Um, we also know that rock art can communicate um, things can communicate. Um, so it might be a form of writing um, and knowledge more broadly. Um, and so I try to stay away from the term rock art. Um, though I tend to use it, of course, because it's part of our sort of archaeological discipline. Uh, but I try to also use things like image, um, imagery, or to calling it exactly what it is, which might be a pictograph or a petroglyph. Um, but I think it's really important, especially um, for the folks in the audience, if you do work with uh, indigenous or descendant communities um, and you're working on rock art, thinking through what might the community call these images, right? They may not call it rock art. They might call it something different. So for example, within my own Lakota community, um, community members typically uh, just say petroglyph, right? So the Northwest Plains uh, typically has petroglyphs, so carved and sized, abraded or pecked imagery, um, far more so than we see pictographs or painted imagery. Um, painted typically with ochre or other organic materials. So again, I just, I I will probably use the term rock art, but I think it's really important to sort of think through why we use this term and if there may be a particular better term um, when working with a community. So within my own research, um, I, of course, work in the Northwest Plains. And so I've thought a lot about how have we, we as in rock art researchers in this region interpreted rock art. Um, typically, we see uh, that these images are thought of as being made by probably some sort of male um, person who created them, um, a ma the maker of these images, um, and that the images probably have something to do with that maker. Um, so some sort of hunting scene, which is typically associated with men. Um, we don't see uh, rock art imagery as associated with women. Um, and as somebody who has um, had a, a spiritual role in a, in a um, Lakota ceremony, which I'll talk about in a second, um, it didn't seem far-fetched fetched to me that 
women could also potentially create images, right? Um, this is a sort of um, interpreted sort of painting of what uh, two native warriors might go out and see these rock art images in the Black Hills. Um, and I think it's important to sort of, again, problematize why is this the sort of stereotypical thing that we think about when thinking through uh, who made these rock art images. Um, we typically also see that um, it, it might be one or two people going out, typ again, typically male, um, to create these images. Um, but I think rock art researchers beginning to change a bit uh, where we're seeing how did communities go, groups of people, of families go to these rock art sites um, together and not just this sort of lone artist, um, but a family, a community of people uh, going to these, these sacred sites. So for, this might be a repeat for my Northern Plains people, but just to orient us, um, this is a visual by Kaiser and Klazen 2001. Um, Northern Plains rock art chronology is based off uh, lithic typology as well as other artifacts um, that we see in Northern Plains chronology broadly. Um, I specifically look at protohistoric and late prehistoric rock art imagery. Uh, this is where we see the greatest diversity of rock art. And so this is where we start to see images of elk and potentially imagery made by women. So I'm just going to walk us through really quickly different rock art traditions in the region. So y'all have a sense uh, of where I'm coming from as a researcher. So our earliest imagery is uh, early hunting about 10,000 years ago. It's what the name suggests. It's hunting scenes with both humans and animals, typically humans hunting animals, um, bison, large ungulates like elk, uh, deer. But we also see some sort of spirituality here where we see human animal transformations, um, essentially where uh, human imagery might have some animal-like qualities and animals might have some human-like qualities. We also get Dinwoody, um, which is sort of these anthropomorphic um, uh, beings on the rock surface. You can see um, in the bottom right side of your um, screen, sort of legend rock is well known for this uh, Dinwoody uh, imagery. It's very geometric and very abstract. We then get ceremonial tradition about 1500 years ago. Um, again, most sort of diversity of the rock art. So we get humans and animals, ceremonies, and I'll talk a little bit more about that in a second. We also get shield bearing warriors and you'll see that the very bottom image on your screen, these are human figures with shields as their torso. So um, when uh, young warriors would go out to hunt on the plains, they typically brought with them a rawhide shield that had some sort of insignia on it um, that probably signified uh, their family or their clan, something like that. Um, and so we also see that depicted in the rock art in this particular imagery. Uh, we also have biographic tradition, um, which is sort of the latest in terms of our chronology, which again are humans and animals, but we see the introduction of uh, horse imagery and people riding horses. Um, this has been interpreted by James Kaiser as having um, to do with territoriality um, and, and depicting actual sort of biographic moments um, that particular Native peoples would have had and then um, sort of left that mark on the rock surface. So I look specifically at ceremonial tradition. Like I've said, it's the most common. It's very widespread on the Northern Plains. It includes a variety of different styles. So shield bearing warriors, which I just talked about, sort of elaborate human figures with some sort of um, ceremonial regalia typically uh, depicted. Uh, there's also just animals, uh, ritual objects, um, like a staff or maybe a shield or mirror, um, different ceremonies. And this is going to be really important when I talk about um, the images that I looked at in my dissertation. And sometimes weapons are even depicted. And here we also see that there are far more petroglyphs than pictographs. Um, that doesn't mean that these petroglyphs weren't at some point pictographs. Um, there has been um, some rock art researchers have suggested that potentially pigment was applied over petroglyphs, but because of the high wind of the plains, there's probably some erosion. Um, so we're not seeing the sort of pictographs um, that we might with that particular ochre or other organic materials that we might see. So we're, we're left with today petroglyphs. 
Within ceremonial tradition, we get what's known as track grooves and hoof prints. So hoof prints are typically um, sort of tracks that elk, deer, bison, horses, and birds leave behind. Track groove marks though, which you see on your left side of your screen, are these, and, so, and one uh, researcher suggested they kind of look like banana grooves almost. They're these large, deep, long grooves um, that typically come in threes or fours. Um, and uh, Dr. Linnea Sundstrom has done a lot of work on um, associating those track groove marks with potential bison imagery or fertility um, imagery. Um, and she looked at ethnographic accounts of um, an entity or of a story of an entity called Double Woman who may have lived in where these rock art sites were. And so Lakota women would typically go to these sites um, and they would actually sharpen their awls and needles um, to be able to create beautiful quill work. And what's left in the, in the rock surface are these track group markings. They're very widespread from Montana to North Carolina. They're very common at the Cave Hill site in South Dakota. There's an abundance of them, sort of the highest concentration. Um, but I have talked to a few Southwest folks here at WSU um, and some of them have noted that there might be these track group markings in the Southwest as well. Um, so this is sort of uh, a new area that I'm looking at is how, how widespread might these track group marks be. But this is one of our only certain depictions um, or certain imagery that we know women would have created in the Northwest Plains. So again, I go back to this question of, okay, we've interpreted rock art um, we know that there is at least one type of style or imagery that women created. Um, and so my question was, how widespread is this? And might this relate to contemporary Lakota women's uh, spiritual roles, as well as spiritual roles they may have had in the past? So I'm not going to bore you with the very specific research questions I did for my dissertation, but just for a vague sort of general overview, um, I tried to understand how elk imagery, and I'll talk about why elk are important in a second, why elk imagery could potentially um, give us insight on Lakota elk ceremonies um, and how that might actually have an implication for understanding the role of women in creating some of these images, but also their spiritual role. And to do this, I decided to weave together both our sort of Western archaeological interpretive methods and frameworks, along with Indigenous scholarship, and specifically looking to Indigenous women scholars. The ultimate goal, and something I'm still working on, is sort of creating an Indigenous-centered methodology in order to recontextualize these sites, reinterpret them from an Indigenous perspective, um, with the ultimate goal of being of bringing Native people back to these rock art sites and re-engaging with them um, in a culturally appropriate and celebrated way. So the first step of my work was thinking through how Lakota people understand the elk. Um, my Lakota family um, currently is revitalizing a ceremony known as the elk dance ceremony or in Lakota, Hehaka Wachipi. Um, ethnographically, we see that there were elk dreamer societies, so both men and women could have dreams of elk, um, and they created societies. And one of the things that they would do is then do this elk dance ceremony. Um, the elk represents love and healing and compassion for Lakota people. Um, and so it's important to honor the elk through this dance um, because the elk gives us these things. Um, in the ethnographic record, though, uh, we see that uh, ethnographers really focused on male elk dreamers, and there's basically no women in the ethnographic record in their perspective, though we know in contemporary elk dances, um, Lakota women are the reason that the elk dance is, is allowed to happen and can happen. Um, and as someone who has done this role, I know how important women can be. So I was a little um, aghast in terms of why weren't women being represented. And we know that ethnographically, um, ethnographies are just a snapshot um, in time, and they don't necessarily represent the community at that moment, right? Um, but the other thing here with ethnographer, early ethnographers is that this, this sort of medicine or power that people had who dreamed of the elk um, 
is supposed to be for healing and helping people. Um, but it was interpreted as sort of, you know, love medicine. So being able to woo a woman. Um, and you can see that here in the depiction of um, Paul Goebel did of the elk men, right? Sort of having this power over this, um, this Lakota woman. Um, so I, I saw this ethnographically, I'm seeing this depicted like this, but I'm, I was wondering what would a Lakota person's understanding during the same time period be of this elk dance? Um, and so I found that uh, Bad Heart Bull did a uh, depiction. He drew this ledger um, of an elk dance. And what's interesting is you can see here all the way to the right, um, to the left part of your screen are two uh, women who are holding the pipe in there in front of the elk dancers. This is very reminiscent of the contemporary elk dance where um, the Lakota women known as elk maidens um, bring the pipe in um, to the ceremony so the ceremony can start. Um, and so knowing this um, and uh, sort of the elk imagery that we see in the plains, um, I started to think through how might we see, if we know that there's these elk sites, how might women be represented at them as well? So I looked at Western methods of rock art interpretation, which included, again, those ethnographic description. We know radiocarbon dating, um, which helps with the established chronology of rock art styles. Um, I looked at associated artifacts, um, as well as the gray literature, and lastly looked at NRCS, or National Resources Conservation Service, which is through the U.S. Department of Agriculture. If you're interested in uh, geology and ecology of the United States, I highly recommend this resource. It's really helpful. I then looked at in different indigenous methods um, and indigenous scholarship in order to potentially interpret these rock art sites. So I looked at oral traditions and stories. I looked at visiting circles, which is a method proposed by First Nations scholar um, Sean Wilson. So instead of the sort of uh, usual ethnography um, of those sort of formal interviews, one on one, you and the and the uh, anthropologist. Um, I looked at how could we potentially just talk as a community, right? That's how um, Native people talk. We visit with each other. So how could I interpret or bring that into the fold? Um, I also looked at plant history, um, and I also looked to the theory of relationality um, borrowed from Indigenous scholars. Um, and lastly, and though I wasn't able to do this in um, my dissertation, I'm hoping to do it soon, uh, the concept of cultural mapping. So actually walking with community members um, in a particular landscape and getting their memories, um, their stories associated uh, with that place. So the first thing I did was started coding landscapes around rock art sites. So um, these sites that I looked at, I looked at about 13 with this uh, elk ceremonial imagery. Uh, these are areas with isolated um, are that are isolated on the plains. Um, they have have sacred plants, plants that can provide food and medicine, um, water sources. Um, that's really key on the plains. If anyone's been there, you know it's it's dry, it's hot, it's arid, um, and you can go miles without finding a water source. All these sites are on sandstone buttes, which is really important because sandstone is a really easy, malleable type of stone surface to actually be able to leave some of this imagery. And I also looked at um, the important sort of colors of these rock surfaces. You'll find that um, a lot of these sites are either on uh, sandstone that's red in color or yellow, and red and yellow are associated with the elk dance and elk dance ceremony. Then I turned to looking at the EPA's eco regions because I was interested to see what is the sort of range of plants. Um, and so what I found was that at each of these sites, uh, these uh, different eco regions are basically almost like microclimates. They have an abundance of plant resources um, for both food and medicine. Um, and so that really got me to thinking about maybe why these rock art sites are in these particular places and why they're they're so isolated, but also, again, have this abundance of resources that you typically don't see on the rest of the high plains. And it got me thinking about my own perspective and the perspective of my aunties who 
have held on to plant knowledge for, for a, a very long time. And so um, elk maidens are typically tasked with harvesting particular plants that have healing properties. Um, this is a image that I took from uh, 2019, 2018, when I was still in the role of an elk maiden, um, I was tasked with harvesting this particular plant, which y'all might know as wild bergamot, but it's actually uh, in Lakota known as Hehaka uh, Pajuta or elk medicine. Um, it's a particular medicine associated with uh, elk dance dreamers, um, and it is supposed to have healing properties. And so I began to look through you know, if we know that Lakota women are tasked with holding on to this plant knowledge, uh, what other plants might be at these sites? What might be their range? And were, were women potentially cultivating particular plants at these rock art sites? Um, so you'll see here, I have Lakota names, English names, Latin or science, scientific names, and their uses um, based on both contemporary and ethnographic research on these plants. Um, I will say a lot of these plants, I've not been able to ground truth every single one of my sites, um, but over half of them that I have been able to visit, um, there is an abundance of these plants. Um, and you can see that they were used for a variety of different purposes. And again, just a few really important ones, including choke cherry, wolf moss, black walnuts, buffalo berry, wild grapes, and wild sunflower. Again, both food and medicinal properties. And particularly, um, all the sites that I have been able to ground truth um, that have uh, ceremonial elk imagery and these track groove markings have the presence of wild bergamot or this, this elk medicine. Um, the other two plants that are, are at each of these sites include sage and cedar, which are really important purification plants um, during ceremonies. We also see ethnographically, there's actually a description um, of this elk medicine. And I won't read the whole thing, um, but Frances Densmore was an uh, anthropologist and she um, did interviews with Brave Buffalo who was an elk dreamer. And this was in about the 1890s, 1900s. Um, and he actually had a dream that an elk told him where to find this elk medicine, this purple plant. Um, and he used it to put it around um, a hoop that he used during his elk ceremony. Um, and that plant was this wild bergamot, this, this elk medicine. Um, so you can see how important this particular plant is. So after coding the landscapes, I really turned to coding the actual petroglyph panels themselves. Um, so again, I, I looked at established regional chronology, chronologies, site descriptions, published literature, um, interpretive signs, the ethnographic record, um, and also leaned on community knowledge. Um, I also then looked at what particular types of imagery that we see. So um, is there a presence of track groups? Is there the ceremonial tradition, hoof prints, anthropomorphic or zoomorphic um, animals being represented? And particularly what I found is that places that have elk petroglyphs, um, including those that may represent the elk dreamer, dance and ceremony particularly, also have either these track groove markings or uh, women, human women being depicted or vulva forms. And so um, you can see here, track groove marks. Um, the first site I ever looked at was this site in Montana. You can see this large um, buffalo, or sorry, uh, elk. Um, to the far left, you can see an elk dreamer. How do we know it's an elk dreamer? Well, it had uh, the the figure has a staff in his hand. Um, he also has um, he's holding something else, which I've interpreted actually as a bundle of sage. Um, there's like little flowers that you can see in the petroglyph. Um, he also has um, elk like ears and antlers, um, and he also has um, what's typical in elk dreamer dances, a sort of trapezoidal mask that mirrors the type of um, sort of facial structure that an elk has. Um, and so these two things make sense that they're um, sort of co-occurring, right? You have this elk dreamer with this bull elk, but what you also get is over here, a very small um, vulva form. And there's also throughout this uh, panel, uh, track groove marks as well. And so this was the first panel I looked at and thought, hmm, maybe there is actually the presence of women at these sites. They've typically been interpreted as a uh, male elk dreamer going in and creating them. But if we're seeing this known tradition or style that women are making, maybe there is a co-occurrence of these motifs. 
So I looked at some other sites um, and I'll just give you a few brief ones to, to, to ponder, but um, I looked at Castle Garden in Wyoming. Um, this is a large area with yellow sandstone buttes. Um, it has a wide range and diversity of different imagery. Um, you can see the landscape itself is um, very vegetated. There's a lot of different plant resources. There's a small stream that runs through it. Um, in order to get to this site, um, there is, uh, it's a very dry, arid sort of environment. Um, and so this is almost like an oasis, um, in comparison to the rest of the landscape. Castle Gardens itself, um, the, the panel that I was particularly interested in is, is in this one. On the left-hand side of your screen is a drawing I did. On the right is an older photograph. And what you can see here is a bull elk that was uh, drawn, uh, carved into the rock. And then we have all of these smaller um, vulva forms and a large female uh, human figure as well. And these are all in association uh, with each other. And so my interpretation is that the elk was here and then potentially women came and also um, left the type of style or motif that's most associated with them. One other site is Medicine Creek Cave in Wyoming. Um, this is a site with a large woman um, depicted on, with some horns. Um, and there are a variety of track grooves and, and vulva forms here too. You don't see it on that photo in the previous slide, but you can see here there are um, this large uh, uh, elk, uh, bull elk again. Um, and there are associated hoof prints as well as the female form. Um, and she, and there are many different track groove marks in between um, the woman um, and the bull elk. And within the bull elk, there are actual track groove marks in there. So again, we're seeing this occurrence um, of these two types of motifs that typically um, are not being interpreted together. But I argue that they should be interpreted as um, images that are occurring together. So what does this mean? Well, um, a lot of these sites are, again, in the foothills of the Black Hills or other larger um, elevated sites on the plains. They're typically on sandstone cliffs and in isolated areas. There's a co-occurrence of motifs, right, including those women-made motifs with either um, animal, bull, elk, or potentially elk dreamers um, represented by their regalia. And I'm really here arguing that there might be a new macro tradition of ceremonial elk imagery that may be related to elk dreamers. Um, Lakota people are not the only ones who have um, elk dreamer societies. It's also been documented um, amongst the Absalica or Crow um, and Cheyenne. So I would also potentially argue that um, people were, were speaking to one another and talking about this um, and maybe sharing their knowledge um, about how they potentially could have honored the elk. And really, at the end of the day, I'm pushing for relationality. Um, uh, these sites are permanent symbols on the landscape for a highly mobile people. Um, and I, I really believe that these are places where, where ceremonies took place, um, where people were going to honor the elk. And so with the revitalization of the elk ceremony, um, as well as thinking through these elk petroglyphs and starting to reclaim them and re-engage with them, um, they're really part of a larger sort of, I argue, multi-species assemblage where we have the elk petroglyphs, they're on this rock surface, um, they are embedded in a larger landscape with water sources and plant kin, um, we are getting an interaction with contemporary Lakota communities with them, as well as um, understanding, starting to understand ancestral Lakota communities uh, interaction with them. And this is all sort of bundled within um, elk knowledge uh, more broadly that includes the dance and the petroglyphs and the landscape. Um, and that it probably wasn't just a lone person going out to create these images, but more of a group. Um, and, and we know that Native people do things as a family, as a community, and so thinking through um, what kind of other maybe evidence or um, mark uh, were Native people leaving to know that they did this as, as a social group. 
I've also turned to looking at rematriation, right? So really thinking through Lakota women's spiritual roles. Um, and my sort of next step in my project is thinking through women's plant knowledge. Might that be related to birthing or menstruation? Are these plants that might um, be part of that at these particular sites? And then again, with cultural mapping and more interviews, thinking through how do we get indigenous women's um, interpretation of these rock art sites. Lastly, I just want to really quickly touch on, because I think this is very important when talking through uh, rock art sites, thinking through accessibility, what does it look like to physically bring community members to rock art sites, right? Um, unfortunately, Native people have been disenfranchised from being able to actually go to these sites um, and physically engage with them. Um, this is a photo of me on my husband's shoulder doing field work, um, but you can see the large chain link fence, right? Um, and that is a literal physical barrier um, that maybe might help preservation efforts um, to try to stop vandalism. Um, but what does that mean for actual Native people being able to visit these sites? And in that same vein, thinking through preservation, right? What types of cultural protocol that are relevant to tribal communities um, whose ancestors left these images behind? Um, how do we enforce um, a sort of relevant preservation method? Um, I don't have a perfect answer for that, but I think it's definitely something that we need to be thinking through um, in terms of rock art sites. So with that, um, thank you so much for listening. I'm so honored to have gotten to sort of share my research with you all. Um, just acknowledging uh, my, my family, my community, and all of these other wonderful people that have helped my research. Um, and I am happy to take any questions. Thank you all so much for listening to me on this Thursday afternoon. Oh, I can't hear you, Jonas. How's that? Yep, I can hear you now. Okay, cool. Well, thank you, Emily, so much for that fantastic talk. I think it's, uh, yeah, very, very important to get those different perspectives. And I know it makes all of our hearts happy at uh, Crow Canyon to see the the um, relationship between, you know, scientific methods um, and research and also indigenous perspectives. So um, really appreciate that. I've mm. um, got a couple of things coming along in the chat. Um, less question, but more kind of just food for thought. Uh, mm. There are a number of folks here uh, that are based in the Southwest that are um, also alluding to those uh, banana grooves that you talked about. <laughs> um, and there is uh, one one of our educators here is um, maybe suggesting another interpretation of um, scraping the dust scrapings from those um, rocks for a specific sacred purpose of that rock mm. or because of its um, color or tone. Um, are there any other thoughts that you have about how maybe different cultures um, would use those those track track marks yeah you know i again i just started thinking about this i'm thank you all for the comments about them because i think that they probably do mean different things for different community members right in different communities that are are leaving this particular mark um i also know that there's sort of a sort of a almost therapeutic or rhythmic part of doing that particular type of sort of polishing or groove mark over and over again. Um, so there might be that sort of that aspect to it. Um, again, I really only know about the sort of Northwest Plains and that sort of story of the double woman and going and sort of imbuing your tools with uh, her potential sort of uh, power. Um, that's not to say again that different communities have different sort of interpretations or or something that they're using um, to create that uh, particular image. Um, I did talk to some one master student here um, who is thinking about how that might relate potentially to groundstone tools, um, where people are using it to potentially process something um, that we may not be seeing um, archaeologically. So. Um, yeah, I'm, but I'm definitely open to other people's interpretations and trying to get at what these mean, because I don't think a whole lot of people have really delved super into it yet, so. Awesome. Yeah, a lot of, a lot of people are wanting to compare notes from the Southwest with you. Yeah. So. <laughs> um, is there any, like, typology or creative um, techniques that 
are used, like maybe polishing or, or rubbing smooth some of these images that might um, indicate whether or not it was a, a female or a male artist? Um, or is that kind of impossible to interpret? I think that's probably pretty impossible. The fact that Dr. Sundstrom was able to sort of interpret the ones that she did find um, is amazing. It's really, you know, that ethnographic analogy can really help in, in that particular moment. But again, it's very minimal, um, the type of sort of ethnographic um, information we have about that. So again, it can be really hard. I, to the people who do rock art research, it is really hard to figure out gender, right? And this is why I've been really sort of looking at, you know, landscape and plants and other associated artifacts to really potentially get at who were, what is the gender of some of the, the, the makers of this imagery. Yeah, I really enjoyed how you coded uh, coded your research and looking Thank at you. the plants and the environment. That was that was great. So, Thank you. Um, I think I know the answer to this, but maybe some of our viewers might. Is there any kind of a Rosetta Stone that we have available to us um, in this part of the world to help us interpret these things? You know, at first I was like, oh, I don't know, but I think ethnographic analogy helps, right? Um, and I think a lot of us as rock art researchers do that. Um, but I also really think that starting to ask community and indigenous members, you know, what do you think your ancestors were doing? You know, um, I think that that might be our Rosetta Stone, so to speak, is really beginning to engage with community members and asking them for, for their interpretation and perspectives, right? Because we know that Native people have have knowledge, we have stories, we know how these things work. And so um, really, you know, not just interpreting it from that archaeological perspective, but really starting to critically engage with Native people, I think is going to be um, really important moving forward for rock art research. I love that. A living, living, breathing Rosetta Stone. Yes. <laughs> yeah. um, have you seen any um, evidence of like ceremonial pilgrimages depicted in, in the region that you work? I have not off the top of my head. Um, that doesn't mean that people weren't going uh, to those sites as a sort of pilgrimage, right? Um, some people have interpreted um, some of the sites that I work at um, with a, an abundance of track group marks as potentially a place where um, maybe puberty ceremonies were happening. So maybe people were sort of um, doing a pilgrimage to get to those sites, um, but I've not ever seen it actually depicted in the rock art. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, this is just more of a clerical question. Um, mm -hmm. On your chronology, you had the uh, YA. What does that stand for? Just years ago, um, okay. I used those slides from my uh, intro to anthropology. It makes it easier for my students. So I just used those just years ago. Very cool. Um, <laughs> let me just read this one through so I can see. Um, this is just a personal question. Uh, working with um, communities, have what kinds of terms have you run across that um, maybe communities prefer as opposed mm -hmm. to rock art or petroglyph or, or pictograph, those kinds of things? Yeah, so um, I typically, like I said, my community uses the word um, just petroglyph, um, but I know that um, there are some Absalica folks, uh, Crow members who um, have talked about um, uh, writing as ghost writing, because then they go to a site, there might be some imagery, but then it might be gone the next time they go. Um, and it, it's thought that maybe ghosts or spirits left that. So um, there's a there's an Absalica word that I can't remember off the top of my head, but it translates to ghost writing, um, which is really interesting. Um, and I know that there are some sites um, in um, in Australia that Aboriginal Australian folks have said that just like these are ancestors or their spirits. Um, so I think that there, again, there's a lot of different terms and it's going to be really community dependent. Um, I also just wanted to say, I saw that Linnea Sundstrom left a, a, a remark on the chat 
thank you, Linnea, um, about the braided grooves, um, that grinding is mostly a female activity throughout North America. Just something to think about that helps explain why a braided rock art is associated with women's concerns from California to the plains to the Southeast. So um, thank you, Dr. Sundstrom, for the clarification. I appreciate that. Some, um, what is what's the process for um, native folks to get involved in the management of these these places? Um, you know what what kinds of things are changing um, in the landscape to to help native folks be able to go back to these ancestral locations and have a voice in the preservation. Um, one of the things I've been thinking through is you know. One, how to get Native folks um, involved, but also thinking through, you know, having conversations with Bureau of Land Management, U.S. Forest Service folks, you know, um, it can be hard sometimes as a as a uh, academic archaeologist. But I think, you know, a lot of these sites are on U.S. Forest Service, National Park Service land. Um, and so trying to bring these different um I hate to use the words the word stakeholders, but it's it's the one that I'm thinking of right now. So bringing these different stakeholders together to talk through um, what might be the most again culturally relevant and and important way to maybe preserve some of these sites. Um, you know, community-based research um, can be really difficult to do, um, right? It's it's about long-term relationship building. Um, but if you are somebody who works um, at, on rock art sites, you know, it doesn't hurt to reach out to those uh, indigenous communities and, and start that conversation and hopefully get to a point where people might feel comfortable enough um, going to some of these sites with you and, and doing interpretation and allowing Native communities back to those really important sites, right? Because for a lot of community members in, in North America, these sites are also sacred sites, right? These are, these are this is knowledge and imagery that our ancestors left to us. Um, and so we should be able to go back and, and visit with those, those places and, the, and, the, and that knowledge. Yeah, absolutely. Just on a practical note, mm -hmm. um, is there any kinds of things that we can do to mitigate weathering, erosion, those kinds of things, wind breaks, anything like that being practiced? Not that I know of off the top of my head, but wind is definitely a huge issue on the plains. Um, but that's also just part of, you know, the landscape and the climate out there. Sure. Um like I said, I don't have a specific um, way that I know people are, are dealing with that, um, but it's definitely something I think, especially with climate change, that we need to start keeping in mind um, in terms of preservation. Um, we had one viewer that kind of recognized that there were some of the holes that were outside of the, the petroglyphs. Um, we have them down here in the Southwest all the time, we call them cupules. And a lot of times folks will leave offerings of cornmeal mm -hmm. and things in, in those, those holes that have been pecked into the rock. Could those maybe um, indicate like a vulva as well? Potentially, yeah. I think they're typically associated with those vulva forms. Um, so I think, I think they're part of that, um, but I don't, I don't know for certain, but I, that would be my interpretation. Uh, this question is just kind of uh, about your personal journey. Uh, what drew you to rock art as a as a research topic? Um, well, originally in undergrad, I was a art history uh, major, um, and I tried to sort of uh, look at how colonialism may have impacted um, why uh, the sort of famous artists, so to speak, of the sort of art historical canon. Um, depicted things the way they did. Uh, and I was kind of just shut down, but I also was taking an anthropology of art class at the time um, and became really interested in, in how art and anthropology can overlap. Um, and then eventually through doing some community-based digs, um, I became really interested in archeology. span um, And then eventually I was actually flipping through Dr. Linnea Sundstrom's book and saw this image image of these elk dreamers in the rock art. And I went and showed my uncle, um, who's our medicine man, who's an elk dreamer himself. And he was like, oh my God, you have to try to find more of these sites. Um, we don't have any other information um, except what's been shared in our ceremonies. And so um, that's what got me started in sort of deep diving these rock art sites. And so it worked out well because I'm doing something my community asked of me um, while also looking at art and I love art. So it, it just kind of overlapped in a really beautiful way. You're right where you need to be then. Huh? Exactly. <laughs> nice. Um, this one I think is kind of getting at like 
the some of the language um, used around mm -hmm. these things. Uh, this viewer is wondering why um, you're using the term track marks, um, and uh, they're associated with the Bears Ears National Monument. Um, and they were told by a quote unquote expert um, mm -hmm. that they were to collect sand for fertur fertility ceremonies. Um, and she's just kind of wondering, you know, maybe we we tell visitors that we'll never know for sure that we can't know for sure or maybe we need to talk to those descendant communities so um just I, I think it's mostly just getting at how to approach um if if you're out on the landscape and you're with visitors and people who don't have the background um mm -hmm. kind of some of the language that you would use yeah i mean i use track groove uh marks because <laughs> again that's what dr sunstrom called them um in her book and so that's why i've been using them but yeah i think getting and and potentially chatting with um descending communities to you know they might have a story or they might have knowledge regarding what to call those um and what they might have been used for so again i think context is really key yeah absolutely um this question, I'm just going to read verbatim. Is there any connection with winter count pictures and rock art? Um, I believe that there is, um, especially with the um, potentially with the biographic tradition. Um, it is something that I've thought about and I just didn't have enough time <laughs> in my dissertation to look at. Um, but it's definitely something I want to revisit because, right, that's another um, sort of visual understanding of knowledge. And I think that there might be a connection there. And it might just be my own ignorance. What's winter count pictures? <laughs> uh, winter count is uh, sort of the Lakota way of, of a calendar. Um, and so they would oh. paint on um, Buffalo, on the back of Buffalo hides. Um, sure. And, 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 you know, record, um, there was one person um, in the community that would do this, but um, they would record different um, important, uh, you know, events that happened in that community. Um the, the lives of those community members. So, um, uh, yeah, I think that there might be a connection there. Um, and would, uh, again, like to sort of look at it because again, two different sort of pictographic ways of, um, understanding knowledge. I was going to say, Rebecca had a question. I saw the little hand raise emoji. So, <laughs> oh, okay. Rebecca go. <laughs> yeah. Thanks. You know, yeah, yeah. It's always kind of been, you know, my interest in, in, you know, just being out here in the Southwest, I'm a member of the Ute Mount Ute tribe. Mm. And so we take a look at, in, at Crow Canyon, I've been going on a lot of the Fremont trips mm. and, mm. and doing the talking about rock imagery um, in the area. And, you know, I, I guess part of what, you know, listening to, you know, other experts and you know hearing what other people say and you know just reading some of the research when when you're looking at some of the older um writings that everybody's written you know it's it tends to be like if you know if it's a male person who's an archaeologist they're only going to talk to males mm -hmm. and so you you're getting mostly the male interpretation because you know they would never talk to a female about mm. that that imagery and you know mm. that's always been my wonder is like i wonder you know what you know if you know on the landscape because you know a whole group you see a whole herd of deer and everybody's like wow that's amazing must have been a big group and i'm just like okay wait a minute somebody's not going to spend an, an entire day pecking in a whole herd of deer that because that doesn't make sense mm -hmm. so you know just talking to you know looking at the landscape is which you know you're just said was just really important but yeah finding out and reading about that old research and you don't ever see that inclusion of of women even in mm -hmm. you know in, in the archaeological record and so that for me that's always the big question and and in this area we've had a couple of like birthing scenes and mm -hmm. stuff like that that we know that they were female Mm -hmm. And so, so yeah, so no, thanks. It's just been a really big interest of, of mine to learn and understand about the imagery in this area as well. Thank you for sharing that. I really, I really appreciate it. It always, it always makes my heart really happy when, when somebody's like, no, we need to be talking about women, right? Indigenous women hold so much knowledge and are so key to our communities. And yet, you know, we haven't really asked them, you know, their interpretation and, and include them in these things. And, I think it's just really important moving forward in our discipline that we that we do that. So thank you again for sharing. Yeah, well, yeah, well, thank you. And it's you know it's that uh, 
that old thing that everybody always says, oh, yeah, no, the Indian men walk in front of the women. And it's like, well, the Indian women are telling the men where to go. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> um, oh, just seeing uh, Becky kind of reminded me when we were on the um, Ute Tribal Park, there was some images that are associated with uh, Chief Jack House um, mm -hmm. that she pointed out to us. So we were lucky enough to have her take take us out there. Um, and there's one question kind of associated with that. Um, sounds like it's coming from an artist. And their question is, is there um, any individual artist styles that you see um, mm -hmm. duplicated on the landscape that you could say, oh, that looks like it, it might be from the same, same person, whether that's a, a male or a female? That is really interesting. I have not ever seen a particular image sort of patterned over and over again, where we would be able, um, to figure out, um, you know, exactly who that might be, or if it's just one artist creating the same type of imagery. Um, I think it's really difficult to, to figure that out, but I will say, I know that there's a rock art researcher known as, um, her name is Leslie Van Gelder. Um, she looked at finger flutes. So uh, people would, would put their fingers up and sort of um, carve into the surface. Um, and we see this, this is in upper Paleolithic France um, in those caves. And uh, she was actually able to, by measuring um, the sort of length and width of finger flutes, she figured out that there was probably, um, probably a little girl or a little boy who was creating the same type of finger fluting over and over and again, which is cool. very cool. She has a, a TED talk about it. So if you look up Leslie Van Gelder, um, you should be able to find that TED talk. It's really fantastic. But she talks about this sort of prolific upper paleolithic artist, which would probably be like a little girl or little boy who was doing these finger flutes. So um, it definitely is possible. Um, I haven't been able to figure that out in my own research, but I think other researchers are looking at that, so. Awesome. That's a really cool little tidbit. Yeah. Uh, can you say that? Can you say that name one more time for our listeners? Leslie Van Gelder. Leslie Van Gelder. Okay. Yeah. She's out so of New Zealand. Cool. Um, you briefly mentioned uh, possible ways of dating. Could you go a little deeper into that? Is it radiocarbon or is it, um, any other techniques that you might use? Yeah. So um, some folks use radiocarbon dating um, if it's a pictograph. So if it has some sort of organic material left behind. Um, like I said at the beginning, unfortunately, a lot of these sites don't have those pictographs or the organic material to date them. Um, so typically uh, for the planes, because we have mostly petroglyphs, uh, we kind of use, again, that sort of kaiser Clasen established chronology to try to figure out um, a particular motif or pattern um, and how that might relate to that chronology. So that's sort of the biggest way that we can figure that out. Um, also, if there are different... Um, types of of imagery so again uh if we see horses and people riding horses right we know that's going to be uh much later uh in that chronology um but it can it can be uh, a lot more difficult to figure out when you have the petroglyphs versus the pictographs you don't have that organic material um i will also say that some native and indigenous communities um, aren't necessarily comfortable with uh taking pic like taking actual pigment off of pictographs. Um, it might be seen as a uh, destructive analysis, right? Um, so that's just something to keep in mind. Um, if you go to, you know, potentially radiocarbon date something, if you are able to ask um, descending communities, if they're okay with that kind of, um, that kind of um, analysis, because it is destructive. And we know archaeology can be a, a destructive um, process. So keeping that in mind. Sure. Yeah, it was just making me think like maybe we could look at the how it's been weathered over time, but you don't mm -hmm. really know how deep it was pecked in the first place. So you don't really have a basis for yeah. looking at it. Gotcha. It can be, it can um, be hard. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um, this viewer is wondering if you have seen any plants with um, hallucinate, uh, hallucinogenic properties uh, found near these sites, maybe alluding to some kind of a spiritual practice. Um, I have not, um, the plants that I had listed that I really looked at for my discs, um, didn't have those qualities. Um, that's not to say there might at some point have been those particular plants. Um, and again, my sort of next step, um, is looking at, at more plant knowledge, uh, more broadly. Um, that doesn't necessarily mean that they will be at those sites. Um, but I, I can't say that there weren't or were, um, those particular, uh, plants with that particular type of property. 
Okay, thank you. Um, and it looks like we might have time for one more. We want to make sure we're respecting your time. I know you're Thank busy you. <laughs> with your new post. Um, Jonas, Jonas, Rebecca yeah. had a question. Mm -hmm. oh, yeah, she I was did. Okay, say. cool. Thank you again so much. Um, it's just really incredible to to see the work you're doing, especially as it's serving your community. Um, and I guess just a general question, um, I'm a graduate student as well, and um, just sort of curious about the advice that you have for Indigenous students um, mm -hmm. as far as remaining grounded in, you know, a field that is very Western-minded historically and, and how you've, um, how you did it for yourself. Mm. It's a really, really good and important question. Um, I'm not going to lie. It was hard. It was difficult. Um, archaeology, like you said, is a very Western discipline. Um, but I think knowing that my community was behind me and supported me and I was doing my dissertation is theirs, right? It's yeah, there's a little bit of me in there, right? Because I wrote it. Um, but it's really it's it's their project. It's their dissertation and it always will be. Um, and my projects moving forward will be for them. Um, and that is really what kept me motivated. And in those really hard moments in grad school, um, I just had to remind myself, like, I am doing this for them. Sometimes that meant just calling my auntie and just ranting about grad school for a while and visiting with her um, just to kind of get a break. Um, and also, I know it's hard in grad school because we don't get paid that much in grad school. But if you can try to go home as much as possible, um, and it keeps you grounded to be able to go visit or go to ceremony or do whatever you need to do with your community. Um, that's what got me through. And when I sat down to write my dissertation, I knew I was writing with them and with my ancestors. And that's what kept me going. Um, and knowing that I had all of them supporting me behind me. So to my grand, to my indigenous graduate students, it is really hard, but you have to keep going because you're going to change the world. Um, you're going to help your communities. And that is just so, so important. Um, so Rebecca, thank you for that question. That's a really good question. And I wish you all the best in grad school. If you ever want to talk, um, please email me and let me know. I'm happy to chat about it since I just did grad school. Thank you so much. <laughs> Well, I can't think of a better place to end on that beautiful piece of advice, Emily. So um, again, we're we're so grateful and blessed to have you share your perspectives and your uh, voice with us um, this afternoon slash evening, depending on where people in the world. Um, we really hope that you consider coming down to see us. Um, in, I'd love in to. Your, yeah, in between your very busy schedule, um, we would love to show you around and, and, and chat more with you. So let's, uh, let's stay in touch and yes. uh, hope you have a wonderful rest of your evening. Thank you all so much. And for the rest of the audience, thank you for listening again. I really appreciate it. Um, wonderful questions and comments. And yes, I definitely want to come visit Crow Canyon. You guys are doing great work. So I'm excited. <laughs> please, please do. The doors opens. Okay. <laughs> All right. Thanks. See you. Thank you. <laughs>